Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Princeton Spine and Joint Center podcast. My name is Scott Curtis. I'm the sports medicine director here at Princeton Spine and Joint Center. I just had a great conversation with Tyler Joyce, a physical therapist from Active Core Physical Therapy here at Princeton. Um, we talked uh, a, a lot uh, and in great detail about red cord physical therapy, some of the benefits of it, uh, how it could help with uh, neuromuscular stabilization, how it could help uh, treat pain and uh, improve some dysfunction. So uh, if you've ever heard of or, or have gone through red cord physical therapy, um, I think you'd really enjoy the conversation that we had. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Princeton Spine and Joint Center podcast. My name is Scott Curtis. I am the Director of Sports Medicine here at the practice. I'm joined today by Tyler Joyce, uh, who is a physical therapist at Active Core Physical Therapy here in Princeton. And today we're going to be talking about a, uh, a unique style of physical therapy called Red Cord. Uh, Tyler, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So um, here at the practice, we've had a number of different patients approach us and ask us what we think about red cord physical therapy. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to bring you on since you're actually one of the first instructors here ever in America uh, to kind of learn about red cord therapy and, and really teach about it. Um, so what is, is uh, red cord therapy? So it's a form. I mean, a lot of people know what TRX is, right? Yeah. TRX kind of puts suspension... Um, exercise on the map. Right. Um, so if you think of that, it's kind of ropes and and bungees that kind of create a very unstable environment. Okay. And if we get a little geeky here, when pain occurs, a lot of times the deep stabilizing muscles shut down and our outer muscles compensate. Mm -hmm. With the use of bungee and ropes, we create a pain-free, unstable environment that can actually change um, kind of motor programs. So you're literally suspending the, the patient in the air in these harnesses that are, are held up at the ceiling and you're able to isolate different muscle groups to work on it? Yeah, yeah. So there's certain setups where they're almost completely suspended. Okay. So there's ones where we're working on like deep core activation and the only thing that'll be touching the table will be their forearms. But for most part, for, for, for the most part, their hips are going to still maintain contact okay. um, with the table except when they when they lift up. So so when they do lift their hips up, then the only thing that's contacting would be like their their upper back or their or their shoulders. It's definitely an interesting concept. It, has this been around for a while or is this like fairly new? So it's I mean it's a relatively new new concept in the sense of what NURAC is. NURAC okay. stands for neuromuscular activation, so that's the method. Okay. So I think to clarify like Red cord is the equipment. Okay. Neurac is really where the magic happens. Okay. So that's neuromuscular activation. So red cord started in 1991, okay. and it was invented by uh, a carpenter. He was, he was a carpenter, a gymnast, and a sailor. So this wasn't even Not a even guy a with a, or yeah. a medical degree. Or yeah, he had like no that. medical degree ah. at all. So it was interesting. So it, kind of the story that I was told is that I assume uh, being a gymnast that he used he used the the rings, yeah. you know, you know, during some of his um, you know gymnastic days, and then just basically used his skill sets with you know with carpentry and yeah, sailing, sailing and kind of created this this device that got in the hands of medical you know medical professionals, and then they created this exercise system called SET, which okay. stands for Sling Exercise Th Therapy. They started to collaborate with, uh, it, it was invented in, in Norway. So okay. Norway started to collaborate with other countries in, uh, in Europe, and then they kind of created a systematic way to, to treat your back, to treat your you know, hips, to treat your That's legs. Awesome. And then kind of by accident, they, they stumbled onto neuromuscular activation. Right. And the story told to me was this one guy that was, had herbs palsy, essentially he was pulled from the womb, mm -hmm. you know, by his arm and had shoulder dysfunction his entire life, became a PT, was playing around in the ropes, and all of a sudden his shoulder function just wow. improved and completely, you know, disappeared. So and then he brought that over here and, and kind of just ran with it? Yeah, so it, it came over here. My, one of my friends, like, introduced it to me, and I'll, I'll never forget this because it changed my life. Yeah. We went to the East Brunswick, um, you know, Hilton, and these guys came in with these big duffel bags and set up this equipment. They ran through a little, 
you know, PowerPoint just to kind of talk about sure. what, what NARAC is and kind of what happens when the brain and the muscles, you know, mm-hmm. you know starts to communicate properly right. with each other. Um, and then they took everybody through, like, a demonstration. There were probably eight people there um, with array of different dysfunctions, neck dysfunction, shoulder dysfunction, Mm -hmm. balance issues. I had a back issue Mm -hmm. and my best friend had a tennis elbow issue. Okay. Everyone got a chance in the ropes and within five to 15 minutes, everyone was either completely better or like significantly better. And I just looked around the room saying like, I would never get you better. I wouldn't get you better. I wouldn't get you better. So, you know, sometimes people look at me and say, wow, like you really had good vision to sure. see how this could, you know, look, you know, kind of. So that's how you got involved with it. And it was a no brainer. Yeah. It was like, I, I th- this is going to make me a better PT. But but before that, you were doing traditional based physical therapy. Yeah. Um, and, and with traditional based physical therapy, um, are you still able to get that kind of NORAC uh, treatment? Uh, 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 in the same way as with the red core therapy? You you can, but, you know, when I look at, it basically was like two different people. Okay. I, I had a different philosophy when I'm doing traditional PT and now a different philosophy doing, doing NURAC. Um, probably when I look at the traditional method, it was harder to get people out of painful patterns. That, that okay. was the most difficult thing. So when I look at the equipment... I think like the bungee is like the secret sauce. Okay. Because as soon as you add that bungee, it just it just changes it just changes painful patterns. So the the bungee, what it basically does is it, it takes some of the weight uh, off of off of your body and yes. some of the stress off of the areas. And with that stress, it might cause pain. Is that kind of how the bungee itself works? Yeah. So the bungee is u- usually used like around like the pelvic and, and core area. Okay. And it's exactly like you said, it, it reduces some of the weight. So it actually just regresses an exercise. Take like a bridge, for example. Okay. Most people can do a bridge, but then when they do a single leg bridge, right everything falls apart. Okay. So imagine bungee underneath your bottom during that single leg bridge now. Now it becomes, you know, it it becomes easier to do. And then all of a sudden the brain and the muscle after several repetitions starts to like understand what this movement pattern is all about. Okay. And that that makes total sense. And um, the way that that I heard about it is that you, uh, I was very fortunate that you reached out to me and, um, you know, I heard about red cord, I heard about active core but you told me you won't really know until you actually come over and take a look. And, and you were right. It, it's hard to, and, and it's, it's difficult to talk about it. And you and I know what it means yeah. and, and what it looks like. But it's sometimes a little bit difficult for the, list, or for the listener or the viewer out there to really fully understand um, the concept uh, that we're talking about. Um, but I think we're, we're doing a fairly good job explaining it that you're basically suspended in the air while doing physical therapy, um, which is a really cool concept. And I think um, for people that have tried traditional physical therapy and either um, have failed or have gotten some improvement but may have plateaued, I think that um, active core and red core therapy um, is certainly an adjunct that might take them to the next level. Yeah, and that's kind of where we kind of made our name for ourselves yeah. at, at Active Core because a lot of times people will go, you know, back to the doctor saying, like, I've either hit that plateau sure. or I'm just not getting any better. Yeah. And then this just takes it to uh, to another level. And if we use that bridge as an example, doing a bridge on the ground is not really unstable, but then you do it on a ball sure. and all of a sudden that changes it. Yeah. So, so let's kind of actually talk about a case example. So uh, we see a ton of patients. I see a ton of sports athletes, um, lay people who would benefit really the most from red cord therapy. Um, is there, you know, a specific diagnosis or a specific patient population that you think really is kind of the ideal patient? Um, or is it applicable to basically everybody? Yeah. I mean, most people think that, you know, that we only treat like low backs and hips, but we can honestly treat anything. Um, you know, we, we, we treat the neck, we treat the shoulder, we okay. can treat, 
you know, tennis elbow, we can treat ankle injuries. So how do you go about, let's say I see, and I'm just going to take an example, the, the 45 year old who developed back pain, maybe has a, a slight disc herniation, um, you know, really uncomfortable. Initially, we, we treated him with some medications or maybe even injection yeah. and his pain is under better control, but we need to do the long term treatment plan and, you know, strengthen the core and the, the pelvis muscles and, and kind of the whole body approach. So I send them to your, your office. Um, what's kind of your approach, your evaluation? How do you go about with that patient? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So we've, over the years, come up with a, with a system. Okay. Um, so I, I took the SFMA course, which is mm -hmm. Selective Functional Movement Assessment okay. course. So I fell in love with that because it's a systematic way to kind of look at the entire body. Sure. And then I took that approach, added some kind of, stability influences to it to, to see if, if the problem is a stability issue or a mobility issue. So just just to kind of go back, uh, not to cut you off, the SFMA, what yeah. does that entail? So it's basically the, the, the beauty of it, uh, of their top tier testing okay. is that we'll look at just basic movement from from head all the way down to the to the toe ending right. with a deep overhead squat. Right. And obviously the deep overhead squat tells you a lot about the entire body. Sure. Um, and then through that, once you find dysfunctions, then you can go into these breakouts that, yeah. that allow you to further evaluate where the problem is coming from. Sure, so, so it can get, it gets very specific. So if you see, let's say on the SFMA, you have the patient do a deep squat and let's say their, uh, their knees go way out in front of their toes or, or their angles of their knees and their hips are not really symmetrical. At what point do you then go into further testing and how do you isolate that? Yeah. So, so during the um, during the movement screen, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll identify where the movement patterns. Let's take right. the deep overhead squat as an example. Then we take them into the ropes, and we have specific protocols okay. where we test. In that case, I would use the back and pelvis protocol okay. because that tells me a lot about you know the core. Sure. So there's anterior chain test. There's posterior chain test. Okay. Sideline test for ab and adduction. Okay. Um, so those give me a lot of understanding awesome. of what's going on because it talks about the glutes hamstrings anterior core ab and adductors yeah. and, and i i could fix a lot of problems with just those five those five tasks it, it's incredible how you know just one of those dysfunctions will lead to a chain of other dysfunctions right and, and that could be either due to inherent weakness or you begin to compensate for one issue and it kind of snowballs into multiple issues. Um, when you see multiple issues, is there one that you really prioritize over the other in terms of uh, neuromuscular training or is it kind of you work on everything all at once? Yeah, it's, it's a great question because it reminds me of when I first started as a mm -hmm. PT, we would yell at the doctors for sending us multiple yeah. diagnoses. Yeah. But now I, I, I take it with open arms sure. because it's a holistic approach. Yeah. We're, we're taking on multiple things, and it's exactly like you said. If you, it, you can really simplify physical therapy, and it's really all about imbalances. Right. If you can just restore imbalances from left leg to right leg, right arm to left arm, front to back, yeah. you know, top to bottom, like you can fix a lot of problems. And I always have to check myself and say, don't worry so much about the diagnosis. Right. Worry more about what imbalances you're seeing. And what's great about the red cord testing or the NERAC testing protocols is it will show stuff that we can't find within manual muscle testing. Yeah, absolutely. Because I guarantee we can take a person, that 45-year-old guy, mm -hmm. manual muscle test every single joint on him, and he'd be five over five or close to five. Yeah. But then in the ropes, it tells a completely different story because yeah. you can't hide in the instability. Yeah, and um, you actually showed that when when I came over and you know we, we had uh, myself and my medical assistant into the ropes and we were testing different things. And it's it's certainly a, a, an interesting and a, a, um, a I think an appropriate way to to test. Um, certain muscle groups. Um, I always tell patients, you know, who have multiple dysfunctions or multiple diagnosis, look, yes, you have knee pain and hip pain and back pain, but you're a whole person. You're yep. not a sum of your knees and your hips and your back because the whole body is a unit. You're, you're connected um, through fascia. You're connected through all the different muscle groups. Um, and one problem may lead to another problem. So it's certainly appropriate to address the underlying issue, of course, but you also have to address the compensatory issues too. Um, and sometimes everybody asks, well, what's the chicken and what's the egg? Sometimes it doesn't necessarily matter. And I yeah. think doing an, a whole body approach is 
a great way to really treat everything. Yeah, and I wish like in PT school, when I was learning anatomy, you know, you're learning all these different muscles, origin, insertion, action. If they had given me Thomas Meyer's Anatomy mm -hmm. Trains book, it would have simplified. Yeah, sure. It's so much easier. You look at whatever it is, 11, 12, 13 different lines, know where they start, yeah. know where they end, know a little bit about what fascia means. Right. And know what the big players are within those yeah. within those trains. And, and when you say the big players, it's it's not always the big muscle groups that everybody thinks of, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. You know, I get tons of patients who are are you know active at the gym. They're they're super strong. I, I recommend therapy. They say, no, I could just go to the gym and I'll do my bicep curls and my bench presses and I'll be fine. And I'll say it's a lot of the small muscle groups, the motor control groups that are probably weak because you, you work out all the big muscle groups that, you know, everybody likes to see in the mirror. Uh, but it's the small muscle groups that really need to be addressed because those are weak or atrophied um, or just don't have the range of motion. And that's why you're having pain. Yeah. It's hard for some patients to really comprehend that. It really is. And, you know, we've worked with the Washington Capitals, Washington Nationals and U.S. Olympic rowing team, and these are high-level athletes. Yeah, absolutely. But a lot of those athletes and a lot of, you know, regular weekend warriors, they're globally or outwardly strong. Oh, absolutely. And they're very weak on the inside. Yeah. And the reason that can happen is because deep muscles shut down in the presence of pain, yeah. or we just don't create unstable enough environments to, you know, you know to train in. Yeah. So why would why would you be good at a certain unstable exercise when you've never trained that way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it was so simple when I was working with the Jets. One of the um, one of the things that the physical therapists and the trainers would use that was just so simple is you know an exercise ball to yeah. and and get them on like a Bosu ball for balance training and to work on some of the neuromuscular uh, stuff. Even though these are you know genetically gifted and some of the strongest individuals you, you'd ever imagine, um, it's the small muscle groups and, and stressing them in certain environments that, that really will make the difference between um, getting you healthier and getting you back onto the field yeah. versus a longer recovery period time. Yeah, and, and a lot of the studies that Redcord has done to kind of prove that their method has some legs to it, they look at, just take that bridge for an example, a stable bridge on the ground, unstable on the ball, mm -hmm. and then unstable in the ropes. EMG activity almost every single time shows that the activity in the in the unstable environment in the ropes mm -hmm. is statistically significant um, pretty much all the time. So so just the the way that there, there, there's just no hiding in the ropes. I yeah. can think of maybe one or two exercises in the ropes that you can kind of Compensate you kind of cheat. Yeah. yeah, you can kind of cheat the system, but for the most part, you know, you can't. So you can't do that uh, after. So did they ever do studies where they looked at those EMGs and then gone through a course of physical therapy with red cord and then did further EMG testing like post intervention and see any kind of difference um, in terms of the muscle activations? Yeah, I mean, the biggest part or the biggest problem with some of these, you know, studies yeah. is that it's not how we would do it in the clinic. Of course, yeah. And that's that's really because they can't be done with the offloading of the bungee. Sure. Because you, there, there's no way to kind of measure that. Yeah. So my hunch is if we were able to like just put like research on a, you know, put it in like the wild, wild west and right. do whatever we want, yeah. I, I think those numbers would be, would be even better. Because at the end of the day, I think what NURAC is all about, it's a perfect balance between using our local muscles and our global muscles. Mm -hmm. With maybe a little more emphasis on the local because so what of are the some, unstable. For, for the people uh, who may not understand that, what are local versus global muscles? Yeah. Can you give me some examples? Yeah, so an example of that would be like the the transverse abdominis. Okay. Uh, you know, so one of the innermost kind of abdominal muscles. Yeah. You know that you know that we have um, versus like the rectus right. abdominis, which is our so kind of outermost ones, yeah, six versus the outer ones. Yeah, and so those those inner ones really respond to you know to 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 instability because they have you know these receptors that you know communicate yep. with the brain and the more that you can communicate with those type of muscles that have a lot of receptors the better the you know the response is going to be meaning that the muscles are just going to engage more because they're not sure like Correct, yeah. what's going on yeah, is the muscle going to gonna tear yeah. yeah is it is is there some kind of you know, some kind of danger to this to this movement pattern. Right. So they just bring all the troops there, and all of a sudden you get this, 
you know, kind of enriched yeah. uh, motor program. Yeah. How, how long do you typically uh, allow a patient? So in other words, that 45-year-old uh, male, yeah. um, and I know it's different for each individual circumstance, but how long do you kind of anticipate um, a course of red cord therapy uh, will take in order to start waking up some of those deeper muscles and start training those muscles in a much better position? Yeah, that's a great question because sometimes, and this is where like I still get the butterflies in yeah. my stomach when it happens like instantaneously. Wow. You know, you can put someone in a, in a position, all of a sudden those dormant muscles wake up, yeah. function improves, yeah. you know, so we always, you know, take someone through a movement screen, even after the, the initial exam, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll look at, let's say we'll take multi-segmental flexion, meaning go down and touch your toes. Okay. They can't do that. We intervene, activate that transverse abdominus doing a very simple approach. And then all of a sudden they can touch their toes. Now, I know that that works because right. I saw it, but now the client knows that that works too because they saw it. And now they, they have in their minds, not just in their body, in their minds, they have, hey, I have the ability to touch my toes. Exactly. And I'm, I can't blame my hamstrings yeah. for it either. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of times the hamstrings will be the last thing I'll go after. Sure. I'll go after something that most people won't, won't think of right. because... They don't necessarily think outside the yeah, box. Yeah, you, you look for you know the lower hanging fruit, which makes sense. It's the hamstrings. That's why you can't touch your toes. Um, yeah. But sometimes it's the other fruit, you know, higher up the tree, that really is is the one that's the key. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's certainly a great way. At least that we're talking about it right now, using the example of the 45 year old with back pain um, to treat the axial spine, because there's so many different muscle groups that are dormant that you have to wake up. Um, do they stay activated after um, you kind of intervene on it, or do some of them kind of revert back to the state that they were in before? Yeah. So uh, sometimes you 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 hit that you know you, you hit the jackpot, yeah. turn the muscles on, and, and you're the on. best PT course, on yeah. the planet, right? You yeah. get this person better. They're writing rave reviews about you sending all their friends. Yep. But in reality, that that same person can go sit in his car, drive 30 minutes to get back home, and then he's right back in the same boat. Mm -hmm. So uh, how I how I uh, attack that is they'll leave feeling better, mm -hmm. and in that case, feeling like sometimes almost 100% sure. better, 50% better, 75% better. When they come in the next day, ask them how they're doing. Yeah. They say they still feel good or they're not really sure. Well, you go back and look at those movement patterns okay. that you were... And reassess. And reassess. And if you know the movement pattern is still sticking, meaning that it, it stayed in its improved state, or it maybe regressed back to you know when he came in for the initial examination, that gives me a sense mm -hmm. of if it you know kind of resorts back to its kind of dysfunctional pattern, but right. it improves every single time. Yeah. I know that I can get them better. Yeah, you're and, chipping away just a little exactly, bit at a time. Yeah, and usually after three or four visits, mm. I'll have a really good sense of the of okay. the course of action. Um, and and so the axial spine is one thing. Let's say you have. Um, so I, I've seen you know twenty something year olds with um, with throwing patterns and shoulder issues, and and they're overdoing it. Let's say you know I have a, a twenty one year old softball player with a rotator cuff tear. Um, how can you apply that that um, same kind of mentality um, that you've applied to the axial spine and to the core. How do you apply that to the shoulder or an extremity type yeah. of situation? And, and uh, you know, I come from a father who played baseball. Right. My, my, my dad played professional baseball. I'm a huge baseball fan. Yeah. My son's a, a pitcher as well. So, you know, when I stumbled across, um, you know, a research article on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. It was almost the guy that wrote it was inspired by, like, looking at someone going through, like, red cord shoulder yeah. treatment. Okay. And, you know, regardless of the diagnosis, it doesn't matter if it's that rotator sure. cuff tendinopathy, rotator cuff tear, glenohumeral instability, doesn't matter what it is. What's definitely going to happen is your scapular stabilizers, mm -hmm. serratus anterior, lower trap, yeah. are going to be compromised in the presence of pain. Right. So what we just try to do, and one of the greatest exercises for the shoulder, is a push-up in the ropes. Okay. With the push-up plus is that rounding out of your upper back yeah. activates those scapular stabilizers, and a lot of times that can that can that eliminate can the, the problem. And so what that what that research study showed is that they want you to go after 
the scapular stabilizers in a closed chain. Mm -hmm. But even before that, they say, look at the dysfunction in the hips and the core, right. flexibility issues in the hips and the core. Go after that even beforehand. Yeah. Then go after the shoulder, uh, the shoulder blade stabilizer in a closed kinetic chain factor. And then once you're satisfied there, then you go after the rotator cuff muscles in a closed kinetic chain factor. Yeah. So when I'm reading this, I'm like, man, this guy must have been inspired by like what what red core yeah. is all about. And it's the complete opposite of what you think, right? Exactly. You know, the, the MRI shows it's a rotator cuff tear. That's what we have to fix. Yeah. But kind of going back to the mentality that you're not a shoulder uh, or an elbow or a wrist, your whole body is connected. Yes. And one of the dysfunctions that people have um, prior to developing rotator cuff issues is the scapular stabilizers are weak. So what do you do? You put more pressure on the rotator cuff when you're throwing with time and overuse it gets worse and it starts tearing um, and so yes it's the rotator cuff tear but the underlying culprit is at the axial spine yeah. um, so I think that that approach makes total sense when you think about it like that um, but it's so hard for patients especially athletes who say I have a rotator cuff issue um, when you start working on their back and their hips and their pelvis they don't understand all the time that it's because of those dysfunctions and those deficiencies that that led to the rotator cuff tear. Yeah, and so I've kind of, I, I have an answer for that now. Yeah. So during our movement screen, we have this perform plus okay. and we try to create stability moments. Okay. So for, for that example, we have that guy lift his arm up and he has pain with, with flexion. Mm -hmm. And you know, most people would say, I'm gonna go right after the shoulder, yeah. but Let's activate the core. Let's activate mm -hmm. the, the inner thighs. We have them squeeze a ball, okay. go through that same movement, and now all of a sudden the pain goes away. Mm. And they're like, how the hell did you do that? Yeah. So now, now all of a sudden they believe that the inner thigh has something to do with their shoulder right. function. Or you have them stand up on their tippy toes, mm -hmm. lift their arm up in that same fashion, pain goes away. Yeah. And they're like, what did you do there? Well, that's the posterior chain. That's the glute influencing the scapula. You're not just distracting their, their brain by doing that? It, it, it can be some yeah. of that, right? I mean, it can be. But then, so what we do is test them in the ropes, go back to that function, and all of a sudden, they're fine again. Yeah. So then I know it's that and not just sure. the, not just their brain being distracted. Yeah, by exactly. It. And, and, yeah. and uh, I think when, when I first went there, I said the exact same thing. Oh, you must be distracting my brain. And that's why I'm, I'm not yeah. focusing on the pain or not focusing on my range of motion. And then you put me in the ropes and it was the, the same, you know, kind of result um, without the distraction type thing. Um, so it's, it's certainly, I think, applicable, the red cord therapy, as we're talking about, not just to the axial spine, um, but to the extremities too. Um, and so with, let's say that athlete, um, how do you train them to transition from the, um, red cord therapy to working out with their team and their athletic trainers and, um, maintaining everything that they've gained through red cord therapy, because obviously not everybody has access to, to red cord and um, some of the um, instability environments that you provide, but they need to continue with everything that they want to do afterwards. So yeah. how do you transition them to, I guess, a land-based home exercise program? Yeah. And, and that's been part of this like dilemma with our, with our model. You know, at active core, it's physical therapy, and then we don't have like a transition okay. side, at least in our in our Princeton Princeton location mm -hmm. or other locations. You know, we do. So it's like, where do we always say like, are we just sending people out into the wild? Mm -hmm. You know, to kind of go out and kind of figure this out on their own. You know, with our with our model, it it has that performance side of things, so okay. people can continue on after they're done mm -hmm. with with therapy. But to answer, you know, the question on the home exercise. Most people are like, I can't do these exercises because they were in a painful state, right? right? So that so they couldn't do a that that bridge that we were talking about mm -hmm. because every time it was painful. But the reason it was painful because the system just wasn't working right. the way that it should. So our job is really, you know, I almost call ourselves like 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 mechanics. We yeah. just fix what's broken, and then all of a sudden. It the car works again. fine, yeah. right? If the tire's low, fill sure. it up, and then all of a sudden you didn't drive any different yeah. you just filled up the tire and so we kind of fill your you know kind of core up with yeah. some with some stability and then all of a sudden you can you can handle those but we we also like to give exercises that are similar to to what you know people do in sure. the ropes so it's it can be a challenge but you know we've been doing this long enough that yeah. that we you know we've kind of figured that out yeah and and i think um you know just some simple 
So first off, half the battle, I think, is education, right? Big so um, if the person doesn't realize that there's neuromuscular instability or they don't know how to activate those smaller muscle groups or don't know that the extremity is hurting because of an axial issue, um, they're, they're going to fall into the same patterns. Even if they get better with traditional physical therapy and do the home exercises, um, they still need to understand what's going on. And I think with the, the red cord, you're showing them you know, in real time that there are some major issues here. And I think that in itself is half the battle and teaching them some postural education or ways to do certain movements to engage and activate core muscle groups that you wouldn't normally do. Um, that in itself, I think will transition to a home exercise program, so to speak, um, because you're aware of your own body. And yeah. I think that's part of half the battle at least. Yeah. And that's why we, you know, we started this, you know, 55 or you know one hour yeah. um, model is because it gives us the time to you know to do that and I actually been doing it so long I take it for granted this you know this gift of 55 minutes is like so special yeah. because you get a chance to go over those things and I think some important things to discuss are just basic anatomy teach them about sure. myofascial chains you don't have to be an expert in it but understand that everything is connected basic pain science, that when pain occurs, it shuts down yep. those scapular stabilizers, shuts down mm -hmm. the transverse abdominis that we were talking about. And people really like appreciate that. Yeah, and it's absolutely. not like overwhelming them with all this crazy, you know, medical jargon. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very simple stuff. And people really do appreciate that. And it, it and, you know, I kind of take for granted that, you know, because I've been doing it so long that, that that is that's a huge piece of why you know why we're having so much success. Yeah, absolutely, and I think uh, and one of the things that I, I love about Active Core is the, the fact that you're spending a full hour with uh, the patient one on one. I I, I always. Um, struggle with with physical therapy groups where there's you know one therapist three or four patients um, and it's basically you know one person is being treated for a rotator cuff issue one patient is being treated for a back issue and it's like you know all right here's some heat go in the corner do 10 of these and 10 of these and I'll be back in you know 15 minutes I, I think that's that's a frustrating thing for obviously for me as, as the provider, but also as the patient. I mean, a lot of that you could just do at home. Um, so I certainly appreciate what you guys do, spending that much time one on one with the, the patient. Yeah. And and to be brutally honest, the, the model's broken. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, you know, how much money we spend on muscular skeletal injuries, we spend over eighty billion dollars. That's a lot. Guess how? Guess what percentage of those people are actually consuming physical therapy services? Like a, a percentage? Fifty percent. Eight percent. Eight percent. Eight percent. Wow. So that's basically saying that nobody trusts, you know, what we're doing, that's and 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 that shows that the model's broken, and that's why we we're disrupting yeah. the field, yeah. and we're showing that it, that it's that it, that it works. Yeah. People are now realizing that. If you want to get good care, you have to pay for it, right? It's it's becoming it's it's like anything else. It's unfortunate, yeah. You know, if you want good food, you 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 go to a good restaurant, and you're gonna you're gonna pay a little bit more for it. Yeah, um, it, it's certainly you know something to to consider. It's it's um, it's hard to you know uh, explain to to patients the process of physical therapy. And we've talked about physical therapy previously in this podcast. Um, it's it's frustrating for patients because it's not a quick fix, right? Yeah. There's, uh, it's not that magic pill. It's not that, that magic injection. Uh, it's a longer process and it does require some work. And I, I always counsel patients that we could give you a pill or an injection and it may decrease your pain, but then that's when the work really starts. And I always recommend a strengthening program, a, you know, a neuromuscular training program, a, a stretching program in order to maintain everything and decrease some of the pain that, that you've, that we've achieved through whatever, you know, we do as, as providers to intervene. Um, patients get very frustrated with that sometimes, and it's really important to educate them on it. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and, and we've talked about, yeah. you know, studies where, you know, pain goes away and the body's still like, you know, in this altered, you know, compensating pattern yeah. that just because you give that magic pill or you give that magic injection. Yeah. It's only going to last for so long. It's only going to last for yeah. so long. And that's that's one of the biggest, you know, frustrations. Like people want to get better fast. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I do think our model you know, allows you to kind of speed up that process a little bit, yeah. right? Because 
if you can take pain out of the equation, you know, good things are likely going to happen. Yeah. But it's not like, you know, traditional physical therapy, seeing people in 12 visits and we're seeing people in four visits right. and getting them completely better. Like, yeah. like we're not blowing smoke up, you know, where yeah, by, I mean, by still saying a process. it's still a process. Yeah. And, and that's, um, I think, something that we need to continue educating our patients on, um, that I think even though it's a longer process, it's more of the long-term process, right? Um, yeah. And it'll benefit you um, for a lot longer than the, the injection or the pill will last for. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, one of the things that, I, and, and I learned this from our CEO, my best friend. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, when he came into the field, he's like, physical therapy is very transactional. Mm -hmm. Meaning like you come in, you got a pain, you got a dysfunction, you make it go away, you shake hands and you go away. Yeah. It, it, and he uses the word transformational. And it's to I, I believe that's totally true. That like, I believe that physical therapist should be the quarterback for your health, right? And that you're using it more not as like a transactional thing, but as a, a preventative way to, to kind of keep yourself going. And that's why we want to create this, yeah. you know, this kind of wellness or, or performance model that just because you're out of pain and dysfunction, you know, let's say we got you better in 12 visits. Well, everyone to me is a ticking time bomb, right? right? We got to keep you out of pain. We, we, we just have to keep yeah. you there. And so like having a transition plan is, is really important. Now, if you want to do it under the active core roof, that's fine. Yeah. But if you don't, like you have to continue it, whether it's Pilates sure, or yoga yeah. or some kind of strengthening. But when you start to see the signs and symptoms of what you came in yeah. with, come back, come see us and we'll, you know, and we'll re-educate you again versus waiting yeah. three, four months. And now all of a sudden, you know, your imaging looks terrible. Exactly. You're, you've had and injections. You're, you're worsening pain. And, and now we're kind of right back where we started. And, yeah. and I'll often tell patients who I sent to physical therapy or an acupuncturist or a chiropractor, I'll say, this treatment approach is a team approach, right? Exactly. We're all on the same team. The most important person on that team is the patient, right? Because it's obviously your body. We can only do so much to intervene, whether that's when you're in acute pain or afterwards when you're not in pain. Um, but it's really up to the patient to continue to maintain all the health benefits of, you know, um, the, the stabilization, the home exercises, whatever the case is, um, and really maintain that. Otherwise, they're going to fall right back into the place that brought them to our office in the first place. Yeah. And so we try to dig deep into what every client's what we call active for life goal. Yeah. We, we, we try to get to the root of what makes them tick yeah. and what makes you want to stay active. It could be just picking up your grandchild. Yeah. It could be, you know, that weekend warrior. It could be this, it could be that. And once we can get to the root of what really, me what really matters to them, that keeps them that keeps them committed. Yeah, absolutely. And it keeps them motivated. And I think it's a, a great way to find that motivation and really try to remind the patient as to why are you doing this? Why do you want to stay healthy? Why do you not want to be in pain? Yeah. And, and it's, it's and some people powerful. like uh, you, you just can't help it. But some people just get me better and yeah. then I'm fine. Yeah. But then you end up seeing that person and you've seen them before, too. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, six months down the road, a year down the road and they come back and you fix them up again. And yeah. you're like, you know, you really should commit to this yeah. for it's like, OK, yeah, I'll, I'll it's a that. lifelong commitment. And yeah, I certainly appreciate uh, your approach to lifelong commitment for patients health. Um, we all, all here at this office same uh, share the same kind of philosophy. So I, I know that we we're on the same page with that. Yeah. Um, so we obviously talked about a lot about red cord therapy. Is there anything that um, that maybe we missed that you might want our viewers or listeners to kind of hear about that we haven't touched upon? Not not really. I mean, probably the 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 main thing is that you know I I love like my profession. Yeah. Like I love physical therapy. It gets a really bad name because of what's going on with the with the model. Yeah. You know, insurance rates are going down. So that means that the volume has to go up. Right. But then what happens to the quality of care? Quality versus quantity. It, it goes yeah. it goes down the tube. And that makes me sad. But one thing that really makes me believe that we can turn this, you know, you know, profession around is that these young kids coming out of school, like yeah. they have an option now. Yeah. Like when I went to PT school and I came out to get a job. It was just like, what's available in sure. your in your local community? But now, you know, these kids are so they're they're, they're so educated on what's going on, yeah. and you know, they can see right through a high volume model versus something, you know, where you spend more time with your clients. And you know, I I really feel like we're on the path, but we have a we have a 
we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. And, you know, I just kind of dream about like, like these, like mom and pop, you know, kind of one-on-one practices kind yeah. of banding together, you know, to kind of join forces and say like, screw the insurance company. Yeah. Like, let's create a better way because who wants to treat, you know, there's PTs out there that are, you know, complain about reimbursement rates. They complain about quality of life and they complain about not having enough time to see their clients and yeah. doctors, you doctors know, do the is same no too. Different. Yeah. It's, uh, and it's hard. Yeah. And we're showing that, it, that our model actually works. Yeah. All those things that are pain points for physical therapists and physical therapy com- companies, we're actually proving that, that, that our model is actually working. Yeah. You know, we have our, our visits are going up. We have, you know, our revenues are going up. All these things are showing that, that we're, that we're going in the right direction. Yeah, I know just uh, talking to you personally outside of this podcast, how passionate you are about it. Um, and I know you guys are, are doing well. And I've had tons of patients who are really, really happy at your place. So um, I think it's a, a great model. I think that there's still plenty of room of improvement, obviously, for the medical field on all aspects. But I think that's going to be time for another podcast as opposed yeah, to here. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it... I, I always say this, like no one's raising their hand to change like like our profession. Yeah. And I'm like, why not me? Yeah. Uh, like cause no one's doing it. So like I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. Wow. Like and so it's I you would if you had told me that I'd be saying this, like, you know, after I've gone through PT school and got my first sure. job, it would never be that it's not something I, you think of right out of school. It's never, but yeah. nobody's doing it and it's it can't just be me alone. It's yeah. it's gotta be a team. Of people because physical therapists are they're they're smart people they're compassionate oh, they they yeah. want to get people better but just you know the system is just is just killing is just killing our profession but I know that we can we can make it better and we're gonna we're gonna try to do it just well I, I certainly appreciate your your passion and your enthusiasm and I certainly appreciate you taking the time to to sit here and talk to me about all this um, and of course the listeners and the viewers um, I, I certainly appreciate you taking the time to to listen to us talk about this. So thank you.